The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Welcome to Albany County News. I'm Mary Rosak, the Director of Communications for Albany County. And in the next 30 minutes or so, you're going to find out about one particular organization that I think that uh, you may not know about, may find that you can benefit from, or know someone who can. Joining me today from the Albany County Bar Association is the President, Dan Coffey. Welcome. Hi, Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful, and you're, you're doing well. I, I, I think that... Uh, the last time I had the Bar Association on was just before you, you came in uh, as president. So okay. how, so it's probably about six months you've been in? Yep, January. I took over from Janet Silver, so you mm -hmm. probably spoke to Janet last. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been going great. The president has a one-year term. Uh, we've been in existence since 1900. We represent uh, about 1,200 attorneys that either work or live in Albany County. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you, you look great for the president of an organization that's 116 years <laughs> old. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the Bar Association first, and then we'll talk about your role um, as president. Talk about what the, the mission. I know I know there are, mm -hmm. there are three different um, avenues, prongs, pillars, I guess, mm -hmm. um, that the Bar Association um, lives by. And, and let's talk a little bit about those. Sure. Basically, we uh, I think our mission statement says we're to promote collegiality among the bench and bar. We're to uh, uh, reach out to the community, and we're also to uh, try to provide uh, attorneys to those who can't afford it. So that's sort of our three prongs that uh, we've always worked on um, for attorney access uh, to people. We have a full-time staff. Uh, as you know, Marquita Rhodes is our executive director. She came on board last November with a lot of energy. She comes from the Albany uh, downtown uh, bid, and um, she's really been focusing on repurposing our mission, branding, marketing, and membership. Um, people call every day looking for an attorney. A lot of people don't have an attorney, and uh, a lot of times they, they get sued or they need to sue somebody or they're going through a divorce and it's a tough time in their lives, so they call us looking for an attorney. If they can afford one, we have a loyal, loyal referral service line okay. that attorneys sign up for for individual er practices of areas, and we hook them up with an attorney who will represent them for a fee. If they cannot afford an attorney, um, if they income qualify, we will give them pro bono attorney uh, free of charge either ourselves or with another organization such as Legal Aid, Legal Project, we'll hook them up with that. If another organization is not able to help them, then we're usually the provider of last resort for indigent uh, people. For indigent, and for, for indigent legal defense. Exactly. We're, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. That's something that uh, that the county executive, Dan McCoy, mm -hmm. and uh, Albany County have, uh, have been fighting for. I know it still sits on the uh, governor's desk uh, right now as we speak, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. When we talk about public service, you talk about calls. About how many calls uh, do you think that you're you're getting um, a year? I mean, is it a high volume? It is pretty high volume. I was asking our uh, our um, legal referral service. She said she gets um, about fifteen to twenty a day. Really? Um, of people who need an attorney. Yeah. Um, now so you talked about a, a wide spectrum of, of inquiries, but is there one area more than any other that that uh, people are calling about? It's a pretty wide variety. We do get a lot of family law. Uh, we do get a fair amount of criminal law, a fair, fair amount of landlord-tenant, uh, people who need to get a will, estate planning. I'd say those are probably the, the biggest areas we get calls about. Since we're talking about, you mentioned will and estate planning, that has been you know a big issue over the last several years. Mm -hmm. um, I know my husband and I talk about it, you know, the, particularly if you know you're you're getting on in years and you start to think, okay, um, you know, I don't have any children. What are we going to do with things? We should have a will. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a special referral uh, mm -hmm. for, for attorneys that deal specifically with that. Yep, it, that's not my area of expertise, but yeah, we definitely, if, if you're somebody who doesn't have a will, you really, it's, and anybody needs a will. Even if you're young, you still should have a will. But definitely if you have children, um, if you don't uh, designate somebody to care for your child, if something happens to you, then the court will appoint somebody. So obviously that's an important decision for you to make. So everybody should have a will uh, to protect their assets and to make sure that um, you've got an executor and trustee named. Um, but if you call our, our, our general phone number at the Albany County Bar Association, we will refer you to somebody who specializes in that area. I know you said it's not your specialty, but for those out there probably listening, 
listening and, and interested, what would happen if, if you know, married or not, if they're uh, if they die and they have no will? What what happens? Who comes in? It, it's called dying intestate, meaning you don't have a will. So it would go through the surrogate court system, and um, uh, it would have to, your probate would have to go through the intestate through surrogate court. And, and so, so if, with a will, you can direct how to to deal with your assets. And there's certain rules in New York State. If you have a spouse, then generally speaking, your sure. assets are going to go to your spouse. But if you're not married, you know, it, it goes through who's going to be your closest living relative. So again, it's a decision people should make for themselves by putting in the will rather than letting the government make those decisions Certainly, because I would, I would assume, uh, you know, it's also a very lengthy process if you have to go through something with it, if you're intestate, right? Correct. Um, it's a lot easier with the will. You're certainly. Right. What is your area of expertise? I, uh, I'm a trial attorney. I deal with a lot of litigation, primarily insurance related. So um, dealing with interpretation of insurance policies, and there's a rather obscure area called fire subrogation. Uh, the way I explain it is if you have a, a fire in your house and they think it's the toaster, well, your insurance company will pay out, and then they'll hire me to go after the toaster company. So I deal with a lot of product failures uh, with toasters and fans and uh, other things in your house that cause a fire. Wow, that's interesting. It is kind of interesting. Um, you know, there are commercials on TV right now that have piqued my curiosity. There's one in particular with some national firm, and it's a question of someone's air conditioner is not working. Have you? Do you know the commercial I'm referring to? Uh, okay. Sure. So someone must have central air, and all of a sudden he goes to his insurance company, and he said, "I'm I'm here to uh, to collect. I, I want my my central air fixed." And so the insurer sits there and says, well, you're not covered for that, and proceeds to um, then go through a laundry list of, um, you're covered if there's a zombie apocalypse, you're covered, and gives these really you know, outlandish things. Right. How many times are there, are there issues where people may think they are covered with something when they're first making that initial call to you? Mm -hmm. They're covered for something, or they think that they're, they're being wronged. Mm -hmm. um, how many times does it turn out that, that, in fact, they aren't covered, or it's something that's not on their policy. It happens a lot, Mary. Um, I've, and I've seen it from both perspectives. I, I represent a lot of insurance companies, but I also mm -hmm. have represent some insureds who have had a dispute with their insurance company. So I, I have worked on both sides of it, obviously, if there's not a conflict. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it all comes down to reading the policy and what's covered and what's mm -hmm. not. A lot of times, flood is not you know generally sure. covered. You just have a, a water and your basement gets flooded. It's not covered. But if you have a mm -hmm. sump pump failure, then a lot of times there's some coverage just for that. If, you're, if you did have a sump pump and it didn't work, if you have a sinkhole in your driveway, that might be covered. Okay. Um, Speaking um, of sinkholes, where we have a, a sinkhole now, unfortunately, in the city of Albany, so right. um, I won't ask you to comment on <laughs> that. Or, or where, so, so you do get some questions about who, what what may be covered and what may not. What is and what isn't. All the, and a lot of times it runs into, like for example, if you um, live in your house, mm -hmm. it's covered. If you decide one day to move it out and rent it to somebody, mm -hmm. a lot of people would know you better call your agent and change because that changes the risk. If you're not living in your house and you're renting it to others uh, and then there's a fire, there's a good chance it's not going to get covered because mm -hmm. you, you have to be owner-occupied. A rental property is more likely to have a, a, a problem than an owner occupied. So does someone have to have special kind of insurance if they're renting out their home to, mm -hmm. to be covered for fire? It, yep. It's a different kind of policy? Yep, because you're renting it out for a business, so there's a business exclusion. You're trying to make money off the rental of it. So you talk to your agent and then it'll get covered. It's just you have to pay more premium. So, uh, and I know we're getting, we're, we're going <laughs> out there, but I, I just find it, sure. it, it interesting. I'm sure other people have questions that, that, are, that are popping up too. So let's say I have a property and I don't live there, I rent it out. The renter, then I would assume, would have their own insurance as well. Mm -hmm. So is that like having two health insurance coverages or two dental insurances? Is one kick in first uh, and then the other, or how does that well, work? Well, generally, renter's policy only covers the contents. So if you have a tenant and your tenant um, has a fire, then their contents would be covered, whereas you as the building owner want coverage for the building itself. Okay. So And, and you might get, also get coverage for any lost rent due to the fact that you have to you know, have uh, you're down three or four months to get repairs, so you lose rent. So you might have coverage as the owner for lost rent and repairs, whereas the tenant is going to have coverage for their contents. Mm -hmm. And a lot of leases require the tenant to also name the landlord as additional insured. Okay. So there may be there may be a possibility that there's there's two coverages for it. If you the landlord tell the tenant, or you move in, but you have to name me on your policy. Okay. Okay, interesting. So probably some, some good advice, uh, whether you're renting or whether you're a homeowner, um, not only is it a good idea, you have to have insurance, obviously, if you have a, have a mortgage, et cetera, but how often should you check 
with your company or, or go over your insurance policy? Well, it comes up for annual renewal. That's always a good time if you have an agent. But, but is that realistic, though? Most people year. don't. Most people get their renewal and they, they pay it. But it, certainly if your life circumstances change, mm -hmm. you know, if uh, you move out of your house or uh, you're renting it or something like that, um, I'll just to give you an example, my daughter plays the French horn and we, we uh, she goes to Binghamton. We bought her a French horn recently. It's not covered. So I called my homeowners and asked them to add it to it. And they did. Um, okay. So when when you, something like anything in your so, life changes, so the, the, you should call your The French horn agent. isn't covered when she's taking it out of right. the house. It, would it be covered if it's in the house? Probably, but probably there would be a limit to it. So okay. you'd want to make sure uh, more expensive items. Or obviously, if you get a new car, that's sure. you're going to get it insured, things like that. Interesting. So French horns are expensive. They are. <laughs> But it's worth it. <laughs> well, good. She plays well. She does. Oh, good. We'll have to. She's in the Gildalyn uh, Town Orchestra this summer. Oh, really? Goes back to Binghamton in the fall. So, um, if she's in the Gildalyn Town Orchestra, do they have a, a regular um, uh, performances in the park? Maybe at Tawasenta? Or? They have the Tawasenta. I think they've, she's already had her last one this okay. summer, unfortunately. But uh, they've had three concerts at Tawasenta this summer. Wow, it's too bad I missed one. That's <laughs> that must have been uh, must have been fun to watch. It was very fun. Wow. For. A, group that just came together recently and, and had only practiced a few times. It was amazing how good they sounded. Oh, wow. Well, what year is she? She is going to her second year at Binghamton. Okay. So we've got many more years that we can probably hear her in Gilderland. Absolutely. All right. I'll have to mark my uh, my calendar <laughs> for next summer. We'll, we'll connect. I am talking with uh, Dan Coffey, the president of the Albany County Bar Association, who has joined us today. We are talking not only about the Bar Association, but uh, about uh, you know law in general. Um, what got you into the particular... Uh, area of law that, that you're you are uh, are I guess an expert in good question uh, I'll give you a little bit of my background I was born and raised in Plattsburgh went to Union College undergrad I then went to Columbia um, in New York for a master's degree and then went on to law school working at night um, and wa living in DC working for the, the federal government um, after law school I stayed in DC for two years doing environmental law and then I came back to downtown Albany in 1992. I worked for a firm called Rally Forest, O'Donnell and Height, and then moved on to a firm called Balk Holloway, Kiernan and Casey. So to answer your question, it was at Balk Holloway that I began working in this insurance area of uh, subrogation and insurance defense and working for or against insurance companies. Very different than environmental law. Somewhat, although we certainly deal with environmental insurance as well for sure. pollution exclusions and, and coverages for environmental events. Sure. So you've been doing this since, what, 92? I so came back to Albany in 92. Yes. I worked okay. for two years in D.C. before. Okay. Okay. What is, can you share with us any, ver any, any of your most interesting cases, maybe, or give us an example of what you found is one of the most interesting? Most interesting. Well, when I was at uh, Rally Forest, I actually did have an environmental insurance case dealing with the Love Canal. There was an extensive okay. litigation dealing with whether the Love Canal incident was covered by insurance. Um, and so that involved years and years of document review and I was fairly young at the time and I uh, had to go out to Buffalo for weeks at a time and go through boxes and boxes so that was probably one of my more interesting and lengthy cases that I've worked on. And yet no uh, no lawyers in the family other than other than yourself? No lawyers in the family. Uh, I have two daughters. My older daughter does not seem inclined towards law, the, uh, the French horn player. My younger daughter is going into her freshman year at Bethlehem and uh, she says the law is a possibility. Really? So we'll see. Okay. Well, just just wondering because maybe maybe some of those little, little crumbs of, of advice and uh, what she's heard maybe is uh, will we'll, uh, move I her in that direction. Took her to the office one day and she sat in the conference room and I was on the phone all day. We walked out of the building. She said, "Is this what you do all day?" And I said, "Yes." And she said, "I don't want to be a lawyer because." Of course, TV, it looks so, you know, oh, sure. exciting on television. They solve everything in 30 in, in right. thirty or 60 minutes. It's, you know, law and order. Exactly. I mean, how many how many different spinoffs do we have of that? So we all know that everything is going to be solved in 60 minutes or less. Um, let's talk more about the Bar Association. Sure. Uh, let's talk about the, the makeup of, um, of the membership because... Mm -hmm. um, we were talking a little bit about you know your area of expertise, but I would assume that uh, there are all all areas that are covered by membership, and you've talked about the loyal re um, uh, referral mm -hmm. uh, service. So, what are some of the other areas that are that are commonly asked about, and and that you would refer uh, folks who call in to? Um, 
Well, as I say, uh, a lot, we have a lot of our members are small and solos. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, there's a lot of big firms downtown, and uh, I worked for a, for Barclay Damon before I, I set up my own shop about eight years ago. Um, so we represent uh, a wide spectrum of people who are small and solos, people in big firms, and also people in the public sector. The largest employer in Albany County of lawyers is the, the government, ma mainly the state, but also the district attorney's office, the court counsel's yeah. office. Um, so we have a group of uh, attorneys in public service that we've gotten um, more active this year. In fact, John Riley, Corp Counsel, is the, our co-chair of it. And um, we're getting in, uh, more attorneys involved because as they, they're not working for private firms. Um, and um, we're trying to reach out to their special needs because that's an area where we have, traditionally we've been mainly private sector attorneys, so we're really trying to get more attorneys in government to, to see that we're there for them as well. And we have a committee set up for them. Um, and we also have a small and solo group, which I was co-chairing until I moved up to the presidency this year, uh, which again, designs programs and continuing education just for attorneys that are less than, less than 10, you know, mm -hmm. two to 10 attorneys. Uh, and we also have a young lawyers uh, committee. And all of those committees are very active uh, the young lawyers uh, did a hike in the Adirondacks in the spring. They're going to do a hike in the Catskills in the fall. Hmm. Uh, we have a brewery tour. It's going to start in Clifton Park uh, and visit the different breweries. And we have continuing legal education. We have two to three a month uh, designed to try to meet the various group needs of our different members. So it's really a way about it. It's, it's the networking and, and meeting people on different levels. Mm -hmm. I guess that's important. And I think we're all, no matter what field you're in, we're, we're finding that, you know, that whole networking, just like going to work and being in an office all day and on the phone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's very different when you look at an, another generation. So, is that challenging um, for you as the president as you're looking at new at, at increasing membership and new members? Yeah, a lot of bar memberships have um, fallen off at the state level. The New York State Bar, the American Bar, everybody's struggling to try to figure out why less and less people are joining. Um, is it because of the internet and so-called social media? Is it that young people interact through Facebook or uh, Snapchat or whatever, and they, they don't see the need for it? But we've had success this year. Our membership numbers are up. I think more and more people see the value of it. Um, as I say, one of the things we do is every attorney every two years has to have 24 hours of continuing legal mm -hmm. education. And we always provide those programs. Uh, a lot of people get them through the internet for free. But you miss the social interaction. People still like to go out. So we'll have one at Jack's Oyster House. We'll have one in the county building. We'll mm -hmm. have one out on Wolf Road where people can go out to lunch and socialize and get their CLE credit at the same time. Um, so we're, we're finding that the more you offer to your members, the more they're going to see the value of it. Sure. We haven't raised our dues in a long time, and we don't intend to, and so we've, we've had some success getting more people to join. Well, that's that's certainly encouraging. I know that when, um, you know, sometimes I think um, lawyers, and you, and you would know this better than I, but you, you get a bad rap. You're the, you're the butt, mm -hmm. of, butt of jokes. How many lawyers does it take, or what would you do with? And mm -hmm. and um, that's got to be challenging, and when, you th when we think of the legal profession, I think in general, I use the royal we, being the, the, the community, you think of of an older crowd. You think of, of those who are um, uh, probably not on when you think of the cutting edge with technology, et cetera. And it sounds like that's changing a little bit um, with some of the things that the Bar Association has endorsed. Mm -hmm. I'm getting mainly to e-filing. Right. T tell, me, tell me about what that means, how that would impact us, and why that's a good way to go. Yep, uh, electronic filing it means you can sit on your computer um, and file something with the court. And it's been mandated under the federal court system for probably 10, 15 years. You, if you're in federal court, you have to electronically file things. They will not accept paper, generally speaking. Albany County and, and many counties um, still um, allow you to go down to the clerk's office, uh, to Bruce Hidley's office, and file things by paper. Um, Albany actually has um, optional electronic filing. So you can initiate electronically if you want to. It's not required. Um, some areas are moving to mandatory e-filing where you have to do it. It's, it's not an option. Surrogates Court uh, in Albany is now doing it. Um, and um, a few other areas are starting to move towards uh, mandatory e-filing. So it would be um, the court system that would mandate that, that move ultimately. Surrogate and tax certiorari cases are, are now going mandated as of 2016. Okay. Um, and we've had conversations with uh, Mr. Hidley, with Charlie Diamond, the court clerk, and also the chief administrative judge Breslin about moving towards all mandatory e-filing in Albany County next year. Uh, 
there are some infrastructure concerns, you know, and how the clerk's office would deal with it. But I find talking to my members, more and more people would like the convenience. And instead of running down to the courthouse at quarter to five trying to paper file something, you can you can be in your pajamas and file something at eleven o'clock that day. It's still considered mm -hmm. timely filed. Sure. Um, and we've had a number of training sessions uh, at the county building. There's another one coming up in September. Uh, we make them free to the public, so you can come and learn. And hopefully, we're hoping that more people try it out. They'll like it and, and move towards it. it saves for me being a small uh, lawyer uh, not having to photocopy all the exhibits it, and not having to mail them out so there's a, a lot of exp um, expense savings to the attorneys and their clients not having to right. paper file everything right so so someone at home would see a benefit as well should they should they need the services of an attorney and, and the e-filing were, were yep. part of the process as long as you have a scanner yeah you can you can scan and file from anywhere and there's a big saving the, the judges tend to like it because you can log in from anywhere on your iPad or your computer and see your docket. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a paper file, you literally have to get the paper sure. file and, and weed your way through it. Sure. So. There's nothing worse than when I will be at my computer and all of a sudden a little, I'll get a little pop-up that says my, um, my, uh, my scan my scan to computer is uh, is no longer active, and you have to redo that. But you don't realize how much you really rely right. on on doing that, and how we've moved in that direction. That's not the only effort that that the Albany County Bar Association has has been behind. There are some other things, and one that's very closely related to Albany County Executive Dan McCoy, mm -hmm. and that is indigent legal services. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you talk about a, a little bit, if if you could? Um, Indigent legal services, uh, those services to um, to really level the playing field mm -hmm. um, for those who can't afford an attorney. Uh, and County Executive McCoy was um, was successful in in working with uh, Assemblywoman uh, Pat Fahey and Senator uh, DeFrancisco on the state level, mm -hmm. and getting unanimous approval in in both of those legislative bodies to pass and say, Governor. We need to provide counties mm -hmm. with a financial benefit. It will help the counties, and it will help mm -hmm. those who need representation. And yet it, it sits on the governor's desk. Where has the Bar Association, and I know I've already given it away, what has the Bar Association done in, in, in terms of supporting that? When we heard about... Um, um Mr. McCoy's initiative last fall, we our board met and we discussed it and we voted unanimously to support the effort. Uh, as you say, we, our phones are ringing constantly. People need a lawyer, mainly in the civil context, civil suits involving you know mainly money, matrimonial things like that. We don't get into uh, criminal referrals, but. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, 50 years ago in Gideon versus Wainwright said mm -hmm. that uh, under the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution, everybody has a right to an attorney. That's what our Constitution says. In order for that to have meaning in today's world, that means you have to have somebody to pay for it because sure. you, very few attorneys, unfortunately, are willing to go out and represent criminal defendants for free. So in order for the Sixth Amendment to have teeth, the Supreme Court said in Gideon, that you have to have a mechanism to fund it. And uh, when New York State, back in the 1960s, when this mandate came down, they passed it on to the counties. So each county had to set up a system to provide legal defense for indigent uh, attorneys. And the push has been back to push that back to the state level. A number of counties were involved in a lawsuit, and apparently they won. Um, Albany County wasn't involved in that lawsuit, but the finding of the court was that it's a, a, a fundamental function and that it should be a state effort. So the legislature in June, um, with the help of Mr. McCoy, Assemblywoman Fahey, and others, um, passed legislation to push the mandate over time. It won't happen the first year, but it will be phased in over a number of years. I think it's $15 million or something that it costs mm -hmm. Albany County taxpayers. I believe it's the second highest unfunded mandate to Albany County taxpayers. So a, a big taxpayer savings pushing it back to the state. And also just a sense of fairness that um, it's a fundamental right every New Yorker deserves. So it should be done on the state level. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll wait and see. I don't know that the governor's been presented the legislation. The last I heard, uh, it had not been presented to him, but certainly um, uh, I have been in contact with the state bar, and uh, uh, we are sending a letter to the governor urging that he sign it, and we hope that he does. So we know it's up there somewhere. Right. Up there somewhere on the, on the hill. All right. Uh, I don't think people realize um, it's not a matter when someone needs an attorney. It's not a matter of them saying, oh, I don't have the money. I can't afford one. There are income thresholds. So mm -hmm. if someone can't afford, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much determined that if you can afford one, the court is going to say you, you can't right. have a court-appointed attorney. Absolutely. Um, 
so I would I would guess you said there are a fair number of people that do come forward and, and do need help when they call call the bar association that do fall in, into this area even though you're mm -hmm. you're talking uh, we're talking criminal situations um, what do you think the chances are I know you're going to send a letter I know you want to say that, that that they're good and you're hopeful but honestly what what do you really think in this in this climate um, I think there's a very good chance that the, the governor will sign it. Um, I think the biggest concern is, is financial. It's going to be a huge financial burden that's going to be taken over by the state. Um, but um, again, it's the, not only is it the right thing to do, you've already had one judge say that it's going to have to be done. So if it doesn't get and done... And it's in fa affecting seven counties, I believe, were in that, were in that lawsuit. Right. Um, so, so you think, well, we'll, we'll wait and we'll, and we'll see. Um, what do you think... As you know, we're in August now, and you've got several months to go in uh, in in your presidency. What would you like to see as your legacy in your in your term uh, from this from this year? Um, as I said, when I took the oath uh, in January, it, you know, it's it's my job just to steer the ship and to make sure it, it uh, stays uh, in, in, in good waters, and then I can hand the baton off to uh, the incoming president, Jim Hacker, next year. Um, my goals have been to increase membership, which we've done, uh, to not uh, to be able to um, to run a surplus in our organization, which we're we're hopeful we're going to be able to do that. Um, to have more community outreach, which we're doing, uh, we're doing a Habitat for, for Humanity build this fall. Um, we have a CARES initiative that the attorneys and public service are heading up where we're matching up uh, needy high school students that are going off to college and getting them supplies to help them when they get into college. Uh -huh. uh, as you say, a lot of attorneys have, there's a reputation problem, mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to get out there and do the best we can to improve the, the reputation of attorneys uh, and what we do. Um, and the number of uh, continuing uh, education um, that we do has, has gone up. We're doing two or three a month. Uh, and the number of social events that we're doing to, uh, and we're also partnering a lot with Albany Law School. I want to mention they've been a great partner to us. We're going to have a forum there this fall, uh, sort of a bridge to practice, because a lot of law students get their degree, they come out, they've got debt, they don't have a job, some mm -hmm. of them hang their own shingles, so we're trying to set up a series of panels with Albany Law to talk about how to transition through practice. So, long answer to your question, I don't have one thing that I hope to do, but hopefully I can move the needle on a few of these things. And keep helping the association should move forward. It sounds like with some of the things that you've done, that's just you've you've uh, you've, you've cast a, a footprint that, that you can build on. Um, when you're talking about the number of, of new attorneys, it's got to be very difficult. I know in in July we, in July downtown for two days, we saw how many uh, young people actually were taking the bar exam, mm -hmm. and it's got to be very difficult. As you said, some, some will find out that they've passed and then hang, hang their own shingle. How tough is that to, to get started? And, you know, and, and how, did, how did they make that determination? You said you have, you have something in place to, to try and help. Um, it, is, it is difficult. Um, the, the number of law students coming out of the law was down, although I'm told it's, it's back up again this year. Um, again, the biggest employer in town is the public sector. So if you can get out and work for the government for a few years, uh, that's certainly an option. Um, I think it was very valuable for me to work for four law firms before I hung my own shingle. And mm -hmm. I think that's important for a younger lawyer if you can uh, work in a bigger firm um, and get some experience and hopefully get exposure to different areas of the law because most people don't come out of law school knowing they want to be a tax lawyer sure. or an estate lawyer. So, you, so if you have work for a bigger firm, you can hopefully rotate around and, and try different things out. Another thing we've worked on in the bar is trying to pair up young lawyers with a mentor, uh, an experienced attorney. So if you come out, you've got, if you're a small if you're a solo practitioner, which a lot of attorneys are, you don't have that person down the hallway that you can go and talk to and get advice from. So we're trying to pair you up with an experienced attorney. Another initiative we just started is a moot appellate court program. A lot of attorneys have to go to the appeals court and argue a case. They've never done it before, or it's been 30 years since they've done it. doesn't matter if you're new or old. Um, you come to us. If you're a member of our organization, we will find three judges for you, either attorneys or ret retired judges, and we'll set up a mock uh, 
a, appeal for you, and you can stand up and, and argue your case, and we'll give you feedback. Oh, wow, that um, sounds terrific. So you're, yeah. doing, you're really doing the role play. We'll do the role play, and uh, we'll hear your argument, and we'll, we'll give you feedback. Uh, we're also involved with the mock trials for high school students sure. in, the, in the fall. Uh, that was a big program um, that uh, we, we chair that, and we organize that, trying to get the high schools uh, involved, and, and they go on to the regional and to, to the state level. Um, I do want to get a plug in for our Law Day run, which is our big, um, for, for 24 years now, I believe, we've done a 5K race. It's held at the crossings now. We raise money for local domestic violence uh, charities. Uh, usually every year we raise between fifteen twenty thousand uh, dollars dollars Sheriff Apple was our honorary starter this year. And um, we, um, we've even had former victims of domestic violence come and run in our program. We have what's called a STEM, uh, Strength Through Every Mile program, where we uh, help vic uh, victims of domestic violence who are not runners train up and ultimately run a 5K. And we'll buy, we'll buy um, uh, running gear for them. Uh, but we have the Albany Crime Victims and Equinox every year through our foundation. Um, in fact, our deadline's coming up in August, September uh, to get your application in. And then every um, December at our holiday party, we disperse the money to the local uh, domestic violence programs that are recipients of our charity. Well, that's wonderful. And, and if people want to find out more, they certainly can go to um, the website for the Albany County Bar Association. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for, for uh, joining me today. Thanks, Mary. That Dan. was quick. That was very quick. <laughs> and uh, we certainly hope that uh, you've enjoyed the program today. Albany County Bar Association uh, President Dan Coffey joining us. I'll see you again soon.